Lake Erie, the 12th largest lake in the world. One of the five great lakes in East Central North America. Of the Great Lakes, it has the highest volume of ship traffic and the highest number of known shipwrecks. Its shallowness and warmer temperatures make it the most biologically productive of all the Great Lakes. And make no mistake, there is something in the waters here something people have been seeing and searching for for more than 230 years. Hi, it's Mike Patron. Welcome to the Quest for Bessie, part two. Like moths to a flame, for most of us, a great fascination with monsters and the unexplained begins at a very young age. Our curiosity for mysterious and otherworldly creatures seems an innate part of being human and literally embedded in our DNA. Bigfoot. Yeti. The Loch Ness Monster. And if you live in the Great Lakes region of the Midwest, the Lake Erie Monster. Get ready as we are set to expose the truth about what is really lurking beneath the water. In 2016, Mike Patron witnessed what he believed was his own sighting of the Lake Erie Monster. His curiosity related to this experience led him to the creation and 2020 release of The Quest for Bessie, a short film about his pursuit of knowledge and theories related to the South Bay Bessie, also known as the Lake Erie Monster. It's now 2024, and after four more years of research and hundreds of responses to his Quest for Bessie program, Mike has created Episode 2, perhaps now finally revealing the ultimate truth about Bessie. Lake Erie Monster. My name is Alvin. I came from Albania 15 years ago. You think I'm a good avid fisherman? Damn right I am. I got my trusty rod, I got my trusty lure, and see what we can do about it today. Oh, fishing in Albania, we fish with dynamite. So what's the biggest fish you caught? Oh, that's carp. And where'd you catch it? Oh, that one I caught at the old power plant on East Lake. Places I go fishing in. Pennsylvania, New York, Michigan, Indiana, Wisconsin. But they don't have the Lake Erie monster like we do. Even even my friend, they talk about it, that they wanna come and catch my Lake Erie monster. But I told them, stay away. And have I seen the Lake Erie monster? Yes, I have. Me and my friend were fishing one night for walleye. Next thing I know, this, this big thing came out of the water. And I was amazed what I saw. That thing was huge. And the whole reason why I brought my life jacket. My mission is to catch that great Lake Erie monster so I can feed my family for the whole year. When I first published The Quest for Bessie to YouTube, I had no idea if there'd be any interest in it, uh, whether we, people would find it or watch it. To my great surprise, a lot of people did. Uh, in fact, uh, there's been a couple other creators on YouTube who have posted their own takes on the Lake Erie Monster, which I think is awesome. 
because the more information that we have, uh, the closer we are to finding the truth about the Lake Erie Monster. Um, but honestly, the best part for me has been to read the comments section on the original quest for Bessie, um, because in it, so many people posted their sightings of the Lake Erie Monster, uh, some from 2024. Uh, I'm gonna give you a few examples and I'll paraphrase it for time, but I, you should go back and read through some of the comments on episode one. And also, please, if you have Lake Erie Monster sightings, please post them here on episode two in the comments. I, I'm sure people would be thrilled to see them. And again, the more information, the sooner we find out what it's all about. Um, so from uh, Connie Ott Hamburg, Turtle Creek, uh, the first one, I saw something. It happened so fast, I didn't even think to try and record it. Part of its body that was exposed by water was narrow and long. And as I said from Conneaut, we were fishing from shore in Conneaut, Ohio at night by the boat club. We both saw something 35 to 40 feet long swim by four times. Hamburg. Not far from Hamburg, I saw a large grayish hump drop and go underwater. Freaked me the hell out, no doubt in my mind. Turtle Creek. At the Turtle Creek access on Route 2, we all saw something in the water. It had to be over 20 feet long. Held its head above the surface while swimming. And this. We thought it was a giant log. It lifted its head out of the water and opened its mouth. It looked just like a snake's head. Pink tongue, pink tongue and no visible teeth. Again, post your comments in Lake Erie Monster sightings and uh, give us all more information and let's get to, to the bottom of the Lake Erie Monster Bessie phenomenon. Today, Mike is meeting with MC Rock Nice, one of the first people who reached out to him after seeing the quest for Bessie. MC has been researching the dark and mysterious her entire life and is an expert in all things cryptid. If you're into cryptids, Ohio is where you want to be. We have lots. The Lake Erie Monster, Bigfoot, but also Mothman, Taley Poe, the Loveland Frogman, the Flatwoods Monster, and Sheep Squatch. I am always busy. So how did you get involved in the Bigfoot and Bigfoot research? I got interested in Bigfoot pretty early. I am young enough or old enough to have seen the Patterson-Gimlin film in the theater. That makes me nine or 10. Nobody had seen that, anything like that before. And when they, what do you call it? They re-framed um, it, they re-stabilized it. When they re-stabilized that film, not that long ago, all of a sudden, it was like, oh my goodness, that is not some guy in a suit. Can I just say, I find it amazing when people say to me, um, how hard can it be to find the Lake Erie Monster? Don't you just cruise around the lake in a boat? And I think to myself, uh, gosh, you can go to your neighbor's backyard pond and spend three hours fishing and never catch anything. And I think this stems from a overall uh, lack of perception by the public about how massive Lake Erie truly is. Think about this. Loch Ness has a surface area of 22 square miles. Lake Erie, 9,900 square miles. It is 450 times the surface area of Loch Ness. It's true, the surface area of Lake Erie is indeed massive compared to Loch Ness. Lake Erie being 210 miles long and 57 miles wide. In fact, Lake Erie is larger than the entire state of Vermont. 
Its shoreline borders Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, New York, and Ontario, leaving many, many more miles of water to wade through if you're searching for something. Loch Ness is a virtual drop in the bucket by comparison at 23 miles long and 1.7 miles wide. So you've been studying cryptids your entire life. Where are you currently on Bessie, the Lake Erie monster? Talk about, is it a possibility? Of course it is, because we don't know everything. And when you look at the cryptid record of the last hundred years, uh, I believe in the last hundred years, which would be 1923, we've discovered the lowland gorilla, the okapi, which is a large herbivore in Africa. Basically, its closest living relative is a giraffe, but it's striped. It's not. It's, it's you know. It's nobody believed that existed. Heck, people thought the platypus was some kind of thing that Barnum stitched together. Why would you believe that? Claws, egg laying, and a duck bill? Who believed that? That's crazy talk. But when you start looking at the the niches in the ecosystem that these creatures fill, possibilities abound. And I'm not saying you have to have a wild imagination, but you better be able to accept that you don't know everything. What do you say to people whose judgment is, anyone who thinks they saw the Lake Erie monster is just crazy. It was a figment of their imagination. So if someone says, I think I saw the Lake Erie monster, I was out on the shore today or I was out on my boat and I saw this and I couldn't identify it. And if it's someone who, if someone has a boat and they're out there all the time and they saw something they couldn't identify, that's a claim you have to take seriously. Does it mean they saw the Lake Erie monster? Maybe yes, maybe no, but it doesn't necessarily mean no. Lack of evidence isn't a lack of possibility. Any lawyer will tell you this. You can't prove the negative. You cannot prove the negative. It's impossible. You, I mean, you go to the easy one. You can't prove you can't prove God exists or God doesn't exist. For some people, there's a rainbow. God exists. For some people, there's a rainbow. It's a prism. You know, um, it, but you, there's no way that you can prove God doesn't exist. It's a belief system. And until there's evidence or better evidence, and until we understand more. There is no saying that there is or isn't a Lake Erie monster or a Loch Ness monster. And you know, the fact that we use monster is a strange thing. You know, it just means something we don't understand. After my meeting with MC Rock Nice, I came away concluding that there are three distinct belief systems which people operate under when it comes to the Lake Erie monster. One, the hard science system. This explanation concludes that Bessie is based on known science and life forms. So what people are seeing is nothing out of the ordinary, but their minds are playing tricks on them. Two, the comic book system. Here, a freakish happening created something totally unnatural. Radiation, pollution, or an accident resulted in some kind of abnormal mutated creature. Or three, the one in a billion system. Like the world's tallest man, Robert Wadlow, it's normal science, but every once in a while, biology creates something we have never seen before. The question as far as Bessie goes, which one is it? Let's start with the comic book notion. In the 1960s, Lake Erie was dubbed a dead lake due to its low oxygen levels. The reason for this was twofold. One, its shallowness, but the main reason was pollution. The waste of a hundred years of industry that had been poured into it since the Civil War. To gain more perspective on the effects of pollution, as it relates to the Lake Erie monster narrative, I'm meeting with environmental historian Leah Feingold to hear her thoughts on the subject. Given that for most people in the world, the first time they ever heard of Lake Erie was as a fiery petri dish of toxins and pollutants, it's probably not difficult to explain why for the majority of the public, if there was a Lake Erie monster, it was 
probably a mutant spawned by some form of chemical or radioactive waste. In 1970, Lake Erie became the nationwide poster child for industrial pollution. Time Magazine and National Geographic both ran stories on it after the Cuyahoga River, which fed into Lake Erie, caught fire in 1969. This event and the media coverage it received helped spurn the 1970 creation of the Environmental Protection Agency, otherwise known as the EPA. How did the Lake Erie Monster get its name? Well, it's actually named after the Davis Bessie Nuclear Power Station, which opened up on Lake Erie shores in 1978. A local paper in 1989 ran a contest to name the Lake Erie Monster, and South Bay Bessie was the winner. The shortened Bessie has been her name ever since. So in the 1970s, you have a heavily polluted lake, then throw in a nuclear power station on its shores, and it's easy to see why people in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s would gravitate towards the notion of a comic book origin story for the Lake Erie Monster. Except there are several problems with it. First of all, there are many credible and published accounts of Bessie well before pollution became a factor for Lake Erie. Historians tell us that the first written account of a Lake Erie monster dates back to 1793. The captain of the sloop, Felicity, reports that while hunting for ducks in Sandusky, Ohio, he startled a large serpent-like creature with a snake head that was more than 16 and a half feet in length. In 1817, there were three separate incidents reported. And throughout the next century, the stories and sightings keep coming. It is a popular misconception that Bessie was a Loch Ness Monster copycat. But the truth is, Bessie was making headlines long before the Loch Ness Monster showed up in print in 1933. evidence suggests that the Lake Erie monster phenomenon greatly predates the toxic levels of pollution and radiation we see in Lake Erie in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s. Also, since the Chernobyl disaster, scientists have nearly 40 years of studying the effects of high levels of radiation on life forms, mostly concluding that the transmission of radiation likely means higher rates of cancer, lower mortality, and stunted growth. So the notion of, say, a radioactive spider biting a carp and that carp growing to some huge version of itself is something you'd likely find only in comic book science. In real science, while you can't definitively say no to that, you would list it as highly unlikely and most probably impossible. So of the acknowledged fish species and aquatic life that are known to inhabit Lake Erie, are there any among them that might be considered candidates for Lake Erie monster Bessie status? Let's explore this. Lake Erie fishing contributes tens of billions of dollars in economic impact to the many cities and communities that surround it. and the engine driving that activity is the walleye. Lake Erie is the walleye capital of the world. And while you can catch your fair share of monster walleye on Lake Erie, no one would ever confuse this walleye for the Lake Erie monster. So 
So how about carp? There are four types of carp in Lake Erie, and all four are invasive species that pose a threat to the lake's ecosystem. The first being the common carp, which was introduced into Lake Erie's waters in 1870. Carp typically grow between 18 and 22 inches, with the record catch in Lake Erie being 45 inches and 53 pounds. There are big ones to be caught, but not really Bessie big. Lake Erie also boasts pike and muskie, both carnivorous predators and native to the region, though muskie are now considered rare. Large pike and muskie can approach five feet in length, which is fun for anglers, but again, not in the monster category. The greatest predator in Lake Erie is the 340 million year old sea lamprey. Sea lamprey migrated to Lake Erie from the Atlantic Ocean around 1920 through the Welland Canal, and without the predators that hunt them in the Atlantic Ocean, their effects on Lake Erie's fish species have been devastating. Nicknamed vampire fish, they literally suck the blood of their prey and are also monstrous looking, but even the largest grow to just shy of four feet, so not really a candidate for Bessie. But before you decide that it's safe to go in the water, we come to our last and best candidate the largest fish species native to the Great Lakes and the one that's been there since the beginning, dating back millions of years to the age of dinosaurs, the prehistoric Lake Sturgeon. This is why I love this condo. In order to learn more about sturgeon, particularly lake sturgeon, I'm meeting today with naturalist Tony Anzalone, one of the area's top researchers when it comes to the discussion of Lake Erie and sturgeon. The lake sturgeon is a direct descendant of a family of fish that goes back 250 million years. They've been called the dinosaurs of the Great Lakes or living fossils because their appearance has remained virtually unchanged for 150 million years. And they existed when dinosaurs roamed the earth. They live near the shore in water about 15 to 30 feet. They're bottom feeders. They eat snails, mussels, insects, and small fish. They're known to be docile, shy, and playful. They actually can leap out of the water like dolphins. Lake sturgeon could be seven to 12 feet long, grow to 300 pounds, and live up to 150 years as we know. The largest ever caught in the Great Lakes was in 1903. 15 feet 2 inches, and more than 400 pounds. It's believed to have been about 150 years old. They don't travel in schools, but they have been known to occur in small groups. In the 1880s, sturgeon were overfished in Lake Erie and their population dwindled to about 1% of what it had traditionally been prior to 1860. Is it impossible to imagine what people have been seeing all these years as a very large sturgeon or a group of two or three that crest on the lake's surface, giving the appearance of something even larger? I don't think that's a stretch. It seems entirely possible to me. saying you have to have a wild imagination, but you better be able to accept that you don't know everything. So here we are, 231 years after the first Lake Erie monster sighting. 
and still no scientific evidence to either prove or disprove its existence, but with a never-ending stream of eyewitness accounts. We do know that it is likely not a mutant born of industrial waste, and we also know that there is a prehistoric fish species in Lake Erie that we still know very little about and that is still active in its waters, one that can grow to over 15 feet and live 150 years. Is it likely to be the route for these sightings? It well may be. Or more than that, is there a one in a billion sturgeon out there somewhere, maybe 200 years old and 25 feet long, one that has defied the odds of what we know, but will someday be discovered? Only time will tell. But until then, I, for one, will keep searching. Thank you for watching, and be sure to share your Bessie stories in the comments. Is this the end of the quest for Bessie, or will new evidence be found? For now, we will simply have to wait and see. Here's hoping we are back soon. Just so you know, my daughter got this for me as a gift.